This is very weird. <laughs> so we are live. Uh, welcome, everyone. So uh, it's really a pleasure and a real honor to have Dr. Lynn Isbell with us. Um, it has been a real pleasure to meet her this year, uh, earlier this year, when things were really nice and calm. And it was a lot of uh, interest from all of us to have her. And when we really started this talk, we thought, OK, we want to have Dr. Isbell to have her talking to us, share her experience with us. So for uh, for those who are a uh, little unaware, I want to introduce her. So Professor Isbell is professor and chair of, in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Davis. And she is also president-elect for the uh, <coughs> uh, American Society of Primatologists. Besides that, she has, she is, uh, she has, she has been working on primates uh, since 1980 uh, and she has been working mostly in eastern africa and uh, her primate feed research uh, spans from through various primate species i would say uh, red colobus vervets patas monkeys olive baboons to name a few and and she started her work um, here on working on bonnet macaques if you believe it or not uh, and earlier this year she actually wild bonnet macaques and it was a real pleasure and more importantly she has been working uh, on socioecology of primates and how predation plays a part in it as well as uh, recently and for many years also actually i would say how primates actually responds to predators and their presence and today the talk will be on that uh, without taking any further time away from professor isbel i would like to handle her the mic welcome professor isbel Thanks, Partha. Thanks for inviting me to give the talk. Um, if if I hadn't met you, I don't think I'd be here today. Um, so it's all all because of thank you. you. So thank you. Thank I'll you so try much. To best for everybody here. Um, so should I now switch to the um, the big screen and and show my talk? Should I do that? Sure. Sure. Okay. okay let me do that. Then see if this will work. Okay. Um, does everybody see it? Oh, I don't think I can hear you now. Hope, hopefully. I think we should be able to, yeah. Oh, oh, there you go. OK, all right. So everything's good? Yes, we are good to go. OK, great. OK, OK. So um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to, to give the talk to the AIP. I um, really appreciate it. I enjoyed my time, my brief time in India back in February before everything sort of fell apart in the world. Uh, hope to come back. Um, so um, before I get started, I, I want to um, thank the funding agencies shown here at the bottom of the slide um, for their generous support of my field research. And so what I'm going to be talking today uh, to you about is um, the kinds of work that I've done recently on um, primates and predators. So this story has four parts. Um, the first two are about primates and leopards. And uh, at least in the old world, they're um, primates' most dangerous predator, the ones that do the most damage to, to primates. Um, and I also want to point out um, the hard, this work, I mean, it was, it was hard work to do, um, and it couldn't have been done without the contributions of a, a great team of people, including Laura Bidner, Darren Simpson, Matthew Mutinda, Steve Ekwanga, George Amondi, and Wilson Longor in the field. Um, so shout out to them. Um, the, uh, so those two parts are about leopards and primates. And the second two parts are about primates and snakes. Um, and actually, snakes have been a threat to primates long before leopards ever appeared. Um, they've been a threat to primates since, since primates appeared. And so um, it's going to be a long, sort of a deep time kind of uh, issue that I'm working on. OK, um, so that's where we're going today. So part one. Um, so we've long thought that predation is a major selective pressure on primates, and um, we meaning socioecologists. And predation has um, been argued to have been responsible for a whole host of anti-predator adaptations in primates, including large body size and large group size. We also assume that. There's a linear relationship being between encounter rates with predators and predation rates themselves. Um, in other words, that more encounters 
means more predation. So the problem is that for 60 years, theory has outpaced empiricism when it comes to understanding the effects of predation on primate behavior. So what do we actually know? Well, we know that active defense and immediate hiding in the presence of a predator are clear adaptations. Nobody disputes that. These are individual responses, though. There's nothing social about them. And despite what we read in the literature, it is really actually not so clear that group living or the number of males in groups or group size, responses that involve social behavior are actually adaptations to deal with predators. That may surprise you, but if you look at the evidence, it's, it's not clear at all. Okay. Now these are the, the more interesting behaviors that most of the theory revolves around. Um, but the reason why there's actually little direct evidence to support these claims is because we collect data on primates. The way we do it is, is typically that we follow them on foot, but a lot of predators and felids in particular tend to avoid humans. They're shy around people. So we don't know what the primates are doing when the, to, with the predators because we're we're preventing them from acting naturally. Okay, so what do we do to get better data? Well, one solution is to remove human observers and then observe interactions between predators and primates remotely using the new GPS technology. We can do that now um, using GPS collars, such as you're seeing on the slide here. And so that's what we actually did in our study. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our study site was in um, and around Impala Research Center, uh, which is in central Kenya, near Mount Kenya, um, on the Laikipia Plateau in Kenya, which is, of course, in East Africa. So this is the study site here. Um, and our study animals included olive baboons, vervet monkeys, and leopards. So we trapped 12 vervets in five groups using the box traps that you see in this slide. And along with GPS units, the callers also included triaxial accelerometer data loggers that can record the activity of the animal as it's, as it's moving around or, or resting. Um, we have to, you have to sort of ground truth it to, to interpret it, but you can get information from their, their movements using those accelerometer data, uh, data loggers. We also trapped six baboons in four groups using these cage traps. They're, they were harder to trap. We, we tried to get two individuals per group, but uh, we're not always successful. And then finally, we trapped four leopards, three adult females and one subadult male with humane foot snares designed by Darren Simpson, who you see in this slide here with the leopard. And Darren is a professional carnivore trapper who also trapped the leopards for us. Um, the GPS units, oh, what you're seeing here is, uh, I'll use my cursor, hopefully you can see that. This is a, 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 a trap set for leopards. Here's bait in the trees. This is what it looks like more closely um, before it's covered up with dirt. And it's, it's, very, it's, it's a really nice setup, very humane, doesn't hurt them uh, uh, at all, not like cages do. Anyway, the, the, the GPS units were synchronized to take data from all individuals at the same time every 15 minutes around the clock for the life of the callers, and the accelerometers took data for three seconds every minute around the clock. Now, the study ran for 14 months, and uh, most callers actually lasted that long, which was kind of surprising to us. Now, to give you a little bit of natural history of the, of the primates, Vervets typically sleep in trees along rivers at night, and um, this they were no different here. Um, they were along the, the Owasso Nuro River, but they'll actually go for anything that's tall other than cliffs. They don't sleep on cliffs. And so, for instance, the group that lived around the research center uh, um, often slept on the roofs of buildings. And as soon as the cell tower here was put up, they started using that one too, as you can see at the top. Um, one one vervet can sleep up there at, at a time. Now the baboons also sleep in trees along the river, 
but they 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 in addition sleep on um, these rocky outcroppings called locally copies and um, on, on cliff faces. So those are their sleeping sites. Now during the day, vervets typically remain close to the trees along the river while baboons venture further into the bush. So as you can see in this composite home, uh, home, ranges, uh, home range view of the study animals, um, the vervets are, have long linear home ranges. These are five vervet groups here. Um, and the, the uh, baboons range much more widely. The green dot that you see here is a, a reference point. It's the, the one sleeping site which, which call, we call the hippo pool sleeping site, and we'll get back to that in a little while. Um, the, the study area covered about 130 square kilometers, with baboons having larger home ranges, actually, than the, than the female uh, leopards, which you see here. And uh, where's my cursor? Here. Okay. Um, I want to point out this situation here. This was the subadult male who took a two-week safari down further south, uh, actually near a, a, a sanctuary for chimpanzees on a, on a neighboring property, he crossed a, a fairly you know, decent sized road to do that. And then he came back up after two weeks and we had to, we took the collar off because, well, the collar failed and, um, and he, was, he was about to disperse anyway and um, we wanted to make sure it was off. Anyway, so this is, this is uh, the, the layout of their home ranges in composite. Okay, so we're, this is all spatial data, okay, because we weren't there, obviously, to, to see anything. We, we couldn't be there. We didn't want to be there. We had to remove ourselves because we didn't want to interfere with the interactions between the leopards and the, and the primates. So we defined encounters as occurring whenever these collared leopards and collared primates were within 160 meters of each other. Now you may think 160 meters, that's kind of a strange number. It was, we didn't have any real biologically, biologically meaningful um, distance to, to use. So what we ended up doing was that was the, the mean Inter, the mean group spread of the largest vervet group, who, which we did um, census every morning. So in the absence of anything else, that's what we used. And now controlling for variation in home range overlap with the different leopards, we found that leopards had significantly more encounters with leopards than baboons did. Um, this is maybe not surprising. If anybody knows about leopards, they do like to, to walk along uh, riverine environments uh, quite a bit. Now, um, vervets also had significantly higher encounter rates with individual leopards during the day than at night. But this wasn't the case for the baboons. So um, there was no significant difference in how long leopards and vervets stayed near each other during the day versus the night, which was about 30 minutes, okay, each time. But there was a difference between leopards and, and baboons at, uh, during the day and the night. Um, baboons and leopards stayed near each other significantly longer during the night, about 150 meet, uh, minutes, um, then during the day, which was about 15 minutes. Okay. So, in other words, leopards had different relationships with vervets and baboons, even though the vervets and the baboons are sympatric, and they, they're using, they're, they're um, exposed to sometimes the same individual leopards. So, their different relationships can be seen in the Brown Index, it's a measure of who is more responsible for changes in proximity. So leopards initiated and ended most encounters with vervets, both day and night, okay? But they did the same with baboons only at night. During the day, where the red arrow is pointing, baboons were far more responsible for changes in proximity around leopards. Now, this may be driven in part by baboons' wider ranging behavior. They're likely to be more mobile than leopards during the day, uh, in fact. Um, but if we look at their movements when they were around leopards, we see an interesting pattern. So on 38% of their approaches to leopards, they either veered off, curved around the leopard, or returned back the way they came. 
And these are movements that suggest that they had detected the leopard and were avoiding it. But shown on this first graph, about on 62% of their approaches, vervet, uh, sorry, baboons maintained their travel direction and simply walked past the leopards, moving as if they were unaware of the leopard's presence then. And the leopards most often stayed put as if they were trying to hide. And this is most likely because baboons are known to attack leopards and sometimes kill them. When vervets detect leopards, they don't move toward them to attack, they're too small, but instead they run away and into the trees. So we can be confident that if they move toward leopards during the day, they haven't detected the leopards yet. Vervets approach leopards on 34% of their daytime encounters, significantly fewer than baboons did. So based then on their movements when leopards were in proximity, Baboons appear to have failed to detect leopards more often than vervets did during the day, despite living in groups that were at least twice the size of vervet groups. Now, it's been hypothesized that living in larger groups allows for earlier or more reliable detection of predators, but the result we got doesn't support that hypothesis. Now, examining just vervets, because we didn't have enough leopard encounters with each baboon group to look at this, we found no correlation between group size and the ratio of approaches to encounters. In other words, the rate of failure to detect leopards. Okay, So if you look at it across the groups, there's no, no relationship there. And if we just look at it from with the, large and the largest and the smallest group, we also find no significant difference in the failure to detect leopards. So again, the group size effect isn't, isn't there, whether it's between species or within vervets. Okay, so now turning to actual predation events, we know that four vervets uh, died of leopard predation during the study, and all were killed during the day. And this was actually very surprising since leopards are commonly thought to be nocturnally active hunters, and other studies, mine included, over the years suggested that vervets disappeared overnight. So what I'm showing you here is uh, the remains of a vervet that was under this bush here, taken to this bush after it was killed by uh, a, a leopard. And um, here are, this is basically what we often, you know, if we're going to find in any remains, it's going to be the mandibles or the maxilla or some fur, which is what you're seeing here, is, which is very hard to see. And again, the camera, camera traps, um, took a shot, took a photo of a, a leopard at the hippo pool sleeping site in midday. So when we remove ourselves from the area, uh, leopards become more uh, active during the daytime. Now, here's an example of how GPS and 3D accelerometers can map out predation events. In this case, a GPS collared female vervet was killed by a GPS collared female leopard in the core area of the Impala Research Center. And here uh, you can see the, the vervet's activity in the days before the attack, fairly consistently nocturnal, diurnal kinds of things. Um, and then what you're seeing here, this is before the attack. There's no synchronization of movements here, but after the leopard attack, you see a, a high degree of synchronization between these two images here, okay? And this is where the leopard attacked and now is transporting the uh, dead vervet to the place where uh, the leopard ate it, okay? Um, and so GPS, uh, GPS locations recorded at 15 minute intervals show that the leopard here shown in magenta approached the vervet, which is in light blue, Okay, from at least 145 meters away where this gold star is. Okay, and then it, it attacked the vervet uh, within the research center at this where, where this red star is, okay, from about nine meters away, and then transported her 160 meters away where the collar was later recovered. And again, this occurred at midday when people were walking around. Okay, baboons, different story. 
Four baboons were also known to have died of leopard predation. Three of them died at night, and the other was attacked around 8 a.m., but all of them were killed at their sleeping sites. Okay, so I'm showing you here in this slide um, the remains of Thelma, a baboon here who slept. This was her final resting spot, uh, a, a small rocky outcropping. And normally she wouldn't have slept there, but she was, she'd been sick for the last week or so. And she got further and further separated from her group. And I think that's the best she could do by that time was to crawl up onto that rock. This you see is a camera trap photo of a leopard with a baboon in its mouth at the hippo pool sleeping site. Okay, nicely for us, we also um, had a, a situation where uh, a collared leopard ate a collared baboon. That was Thelma um, that you saw there. And so we were able to, to do the same sort of thing with the accelerometer plot and the movement map of the predation event. Okay, so the plot shows uh, here the baboon's uh, 3D acceleration in the days before um, uh, the attack, and then, uh, and then in the in the minutes just before death and after death. So here's what we interpret to be the leopard attack, and then transport of the of the baboon after it's dead, and then the the leopard eating the ba the baboon with, and the collar is sort of moving around, sort of randomly as the leopard is is moving the the, the carcass around, and the movement. Um, map here, or the, the, uh, the GPS map here, shows that the baboon um, in the yellow line was stationary on that boulder uh, just before the attack, okay? And the leopard in the aqua line, uh, in the 15 minutes before the attack, crossed the river, okay, and traveled 277 meters to the baboon. And after killing the baboon at the Red Star, the leopard carried her approximately 90 meters away where, she, where he ate her, okay? And then, and then later on he took off, okay? So what was surprising to me after all these study sites that I'd worked at where leopards ate most of the animals that I was studying, um, it, it was surprising to me that how far away they took the, the, their primate prey from where they actually killed them. Okay, so luckily, um, because we knew where the leopards were and we knew where the primates were at the same time, we could calculate um, predation rates in different ways than, than most people do. Um, the first way is what a lot of people do, and, and that is using only known individuals that were census nearly every day. So we got annual predation rates um, using just known individuals. And comparing vervets and baboons, the annual predation rate was somewhat higher for vervets than baboons. So two of 42 vervets in two groups that we monitored regularly. One was the hippo pool group that I mentioned earlier, and the other one was the group at the research center, which, um, we, I mean, we couldn't avoid human presence with them. Um, and then two of 63 baboons in a group that, uh, in, a, in a group that had been monitored uh, since 2011. Um, die, they, they died during the year, okay? So, um, but there's not that much difference between the vervets and the baboons. Vervets are a little bit higher. Okay, the second way is using the entire study population. And because we only had opportunistic censuses of the other groups that we, that we had collars on um, in individuals of, of those groups, it, it was just a minimum predation rate. <laughs> we, we couldn't tell for sure who actually died. But the, the minimum predation rates were pretty similar. But since we know where the leopards were and the primates can only die of leopard predation if leopards are nearby, if we calculate predation rates with sensitivity to the number of dial periods when leopards were actually within proximity and so had a greater opportunity to hunt the primates, the predation rate goes down for vervets and up for baboons, even though leopards were around vervets more often. And then finally, if we calculate predation rates with sensitivity not only to when leopards were nearby and could hunt the primates, but also to the time period of the primates' greatest vulnerability, which would be daytime for vervets and nighttime for, for baboons, the predation rate really shoots up for baboons. Okay, so even though 
leopards were not around baboons very much. When they were, they were very successful at, at killing those baboons. So another way to picture this is that a given vervet in the study population would have a one in 20 chance of dying at that point, but a given baboon, a one in six chance. So, oh, let me go, let me actually go back to that uh, slide. So I want to point out that the predation rate, annual predation rate wasn't, wasn't very high except for under that last, um, those last two uh, situations when leopards were around. Okay. So um, normally when we report predation rates of 5% uh, per year, well, um, uh, that's because we don't know where the, where the um, leopards are and what they're doing with the primates. Okay. So with five vervet groups, four baboon groups, and four leopards covering an area of over 130 square kilometers, the low encounter and predation rates in the study were less a reflection of sampling intensity than the nature of the topic. Predation, while it's, it's forever, you know, if you're the one being eaten, overall, it doesn't happen all that often, even with leopards unless there's a, a burst of activity in leopards, which I know happens. Um, so to summarize this, this part, this first part, we found that across the entire study period, the two primate species were equally vulnerable to leopard predation over the entire study period. But this means that some of our most long-standing assumptions and hypotheses in socioecology were not supported. Vervets had nearly three times more encounters with leopards than baboons had, but both species had similar predation rates over the entire study period. And this even though baboons have larger body sizes and larger group sizes than vervets. Larger groups didn't have an advantage in detecting leopards more often than smaller groups did, either between species or within vervets. We found that Baboons and vervets only differed in their vulnerability by time of day. And this was because leopards are more effectively discouraged from hunting baboons than vervets during the day, because baboons have the potential to preemptively attack leopards during the day. But baboons were more attractive than vervets to leopards at night, because baboons' poor night vision, like all diurnal primates, makes a preemptive attack difficult, and unlike vervets, baboons' body size puts them within the body size range of leopards' preferred prey. So equal vulnerability across the entire study period actually may explain how it is that vervets are able to survive there despite having smaller body sizes and group sizes than baboons. There may be two equally effective and adaptive anti-predator strategies, with larger body size being more protective than smaller body size during the day, but more attractive to leopards at night. Okay, so if you wanna read more about this, you can find the paper um, in, uh, published in the Journal of Human Evolution. I um, just touched on, on the results that we found there. Okay, moving on to part two. One very clear anti-predator adaptation is alarm calling. And vervets are well known for their repertoire of alarm calls for different types of predators. They're classic examples when people want to talk about referential or semantic uh, communication. Okay. These alarm calls are responded to by other group members and they function as a warning call to other vervets. So it's pretty clear that monkey, that, that vervet alarm calls are a social um, signal. I'm going to play now for you. I hope it'll hope you'll be able to hear it. Um, what leopard alarm calls from vervets sound like? Um, they were behind me in the trees at their sleeping site and reacted to this life-size leopard model. Um, here we go. I hope you can hear it. Okay, now, 
There are a few things about their alarm calls that made me wonder if there might actually be an additional function to their alarm calls. Now, leopard alarm calls are louder than they need to be. Okay, if they're only signaling to each other, then they can they can be much quieter. They don't need to be as loud as they were. And alarmists also uh, respond to predators to which they themselves are most vulnerable. This is something that Dorothy Cheney and Robert Seifarth uh, wrote about in 1981. Okay, and as you can tell from this example, alarm calls continue long after everyone has been alerted to the predator. This is something that Robert Seifarth and Dorothy Cheney also pointed out in their book in 1990. So all these suggest that there might be an additional function to the alarm calls. Now one possibility is that their alarm calls function as a predator deterrent. Colobus, Procolobus, Circocebus, and Circopithecus are known to give loud alarm calls. Uh, Klaus Zuberbuehler suggested that the original function of leopard alarm calls was as a predator deterrent, in fact. Now, if this is true, and true for vervids, then I have to say, even alarm calls might have originated as an, a non-social anti-predator adaptation. But it's hard to get concrete evidence of these. So we tried, okay. So we focused the study on that sleeping site, the Hippopool sleeping site that was used by one vervet group in uh, on 97% of, uh, of all, their, of, of all their nights. And the sleeping site is located at the bend, at a bend in the Owasso Nero River. It's a typical wooded bushland uh, surrounded, uh, surrounding tall acacia beaver trees uh, around, along the river where they sleep. So at this bend in the river, we set up three camera traps and we configured them to run continuously day and night, taking photographs, in bouts of three per second when triggered by movement and heat. Um, we enclosed it in a, a very strong, durable case because elephants could, could uh, easily destroy them. Then we also installed an acoustic recorder at the sleeping site to record vervet alarm calls. And this one was enclosed, encased in a pelican uh, case for the same reason, to protect it against elephants. And um, it, it recorded all sounds in one hour long digital files from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. In retrospect, I wish we had programmed it to go um, for 24 hours. Okay, so GPS data showed that two of the four leopards used the sleeping site. So um, here's that bend, here's the green dot or so uh, to orient you. Um, here are the leopards. So the, the blue collar, the blue color is for a young adult male who just, he was the one who dispersed shortly after his collar was removed. And the magenta is for an adult female who used the area. Now the home range of the vervet group uh, is shown here in magenta. And you can see how extensively they used that sleeping site. Now, so we had the GPS collars on two of the the leopards uh, that used the study site, but the camera traps revealed that we actually had far more leopards there than we anticipated. We had at least eight leopards showing up in the camera traps, seven of which could be identified as individuals based on their spot patterns. So, uh, and these leopards appeared on camera on 53 of 346 nights, so 15% of all the nights, okay? And vervets gave alarm calls to leopards on 133 of all those one hour long audio files, over 4,500 4, audio files, okay? Spread out over 98 of 305 nights. So 32% 32, 32 of the nights, vervets gave alarm calls. Now, if we combine the camera trap events with the nights when alarm calls were given, it tells us that leopards were nearby on a minimum of 36% of all nights, so 124 out of 346 nights. Now these are the most accurate data so far on how often leopards can come around vervets at night, so a third of all nights. But the alarm calls weren't spread evenly across the hours. Most were concentrated at dusk and dawn, 
So here's the desk with the white bars and Don over here. But leopards were caught on camera most often in the wee hours of the night, peaking at midnight up here. Now there's a significant negative correlation between leopard presence in the camera traps and the frequency of alarm calls. Okay, what this means is that although leopards could be around at any of these hours, even dusk and dawn, the alarm calls were keeping the leopards from coming close enough to be caught on camera during those times. Now GPS data from the two collared leopards confirmed that they avoided coming closer to vervets when vervets alarm called. Importantly, the leopards also moved away within minutes if they were less than 200 meters away. Now this happened on all the nights for which we have data. On the fourth night, which was in the evening, vervets apparently were unaware of the leopard until they moved over 200 meters away, and that's when they gave their alarm calls. But the leopard was apparently far enough away that he didn't move. So what you're seeing here is the point zero is the alarm call. This is the, the uh, proximity to the vervets. They're approaching up until this point, and immediately, almost immediately after the alarm calls are given, they move away, except for this one who was already far enough away, apparently. Okay, so that's one way to look at it. Not only did they move away, they also changed direction when they moved. So here you see um, the, the times of uh, their locations and their quick movements away. Here are the alarm calls given. Here's one at 4.16 in the morning. This, this leopard took off almost immediately at 4.30. By 4.30, he was over here. And you see the same pattern in, in these other three. The one exception occurred on that evening when vervets moved away. The vervets are shown in blue here in this one and only started alarm calling when they were when they were 200 meters away. The, the leopards stayed put. Now compare these maps with nights when leopards didn't give alarm calls to collared leopards. The collards, the, uh, sorry, the leopards moved continually forward, often following along the river. Now these are again 15 minute increments so they're straight line distances so they probably followed uh, much better than these these maps are showing. But you can see, see the forward trajectory of the leopards whenever the vervets didn't call them, uh, give, give alarm calls. Okay so this is clear evidence I think that leopard alarm calls function not only as a conspecific warning but also as a predator deterrent. So over and over and over again, I mean, my whole career has been, let's pay attention to our assumptions. Let's, let's really think about what we're assuming, particularly in socioecology. Are, we, are our assumptions valid? Can we get data to, to test those assumptions, okay? Let's watch our assumptions. Even something like alarm calls may be a non-social adaptation that has been co-opted by conspecifics over time. Even other species, even heterospecifics, can eavesdrop on alarm calls and respond appropriately. Do we call those a social response? Well, maybe we could, but, they're, but they didn't evolve that way. They didn't evolve. Vervets don't give alarm calls to warn bushbuck that there's a leopard nearby. The bushbuck take advantage of those alarm calls and, and move appropriately away or whatever they do. Okay, so let's think about that. Now, again, some recent studies have used alarm calls to identify areas of greater risk, the so-called landscapes of fear. But if alarm calls keep leopards away, then they actually indicate lower risk. Risk is higher when vervets don't alarm call to nearby leopards because they haven't seen the leopard. So, Alarm calls may be good indicators of leopard presence. They certainly are. Uh, and, well, actually, vervets males will give leopard alarm calls when they see strange uh, uh, male vervets, but that doesn't happen very often, okay? So alarm calls are good indicators of leopard presence, but they're not good indicators of predation risk when alarm calls serve as predator deterrence.
Now, I'm not saying all alarm calls serve that function, but in the case of verbits, they do. So the best way to test the assumptions derived from theory will be to study both predators and prey at the same time to reveal the full richness of their dynamic relationship. Again, if you want to read more about this, and I've just touched on the basics, um, you can find it in the paper that I, I'm showing here on the screen. Okay, now I want to switch gears and talk about snakes, another main predator of primates, and how primates evolved to deal with them. Now we're talking about deep time here, long time, long, long time ago, long before leopards showed up. So snakes were actually the first predators of primates. About 100 million years ago, constricting snakes with wide gapes evolved the ability to eat large prey. And according to molecular evidence, this was about the same time that crown group placental mammals began to diversify. And primates were one of the first of today's modern orders of placental mammals to appear. Perhaps around 70 million years ago, maybe earlier, according to molecular evidence. Now, most predators are best seen from a distance, leopards, eagles, um, but it's impossible and also unnecessary to see snakes from a distance. It's only necessary to detect snakes when they're up close and within striking distance. But snakes can be incredibly cryptic and any improvement on the ability to see them should be favored by natural selection. Primates, as it turns out, have excellent close-up vision and anthropoid primates actually don't need movements in order to detect snakes, unlike what appears to be the case for the majority of mammals so far that we know of. So any improvement in vision that would help primates to see snakes before stepping on them or getting too close to um, be the victim of a defensive strike, that would be beneficial. So I want you to ask yourselves here, can you spot the snake in this image? It's a copperhead snake, it's an American snake, can you see the snake in this photo? You may be wondering why I'm showing you this piece of grass, um, but I'll, I'll give you some help here. It's there, okay? As you can see, snakes can be very cryptic and hard to see, even with our excellent primate vision. So the snake detection theory ties the excellent vision of primates to snakes. It argues that snakes, as the earliest and most persistent of the predators of mammals today, were largely responsible for the origin of primates and for the variation in primate visual systems that we see today. So primates are differentiated by other mammals largely on the basis of modifications to their visual sense. So we can examine the effects of snakes on primate vision by separating out two visual systems or pathways a very fast non-conscious visual system that involves the superior colliculus and the pulvinar, shown by the red arrows in this image of a, of a verbit profile, and a slightly slower conscious visual system that involves the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN, and cortical areas involved in vision, including the primary visual area, V1, which is shown in blue. So the superior colliculus and the, the pulvinar are subcortical uh, cor um, 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 nuclei, and V1, V2, those are cortical areas. Okay. So let's pay attention to that, the non-conscious and the conscious visual pathways. It's gonna, they're going to come up again. So the snake detection theory can be viewed as a two-step process starting with constrictors, which were present when the ancestors of primates first appeared. Constrictors evolved in Gondwana and today are found on all of the same land masses that primates are found in today. Okay, that's the first uh, step. Then about 60 million years ago, venomous snakes appeared, probably in Asia. At about the same time, anthropoid primates appeared, probably in Asia too, at least according to the fossil record that we've seen that we have today, maybe in Africa, but probably in Asia. Now this venom apparatus was a, a highly successful innovation, which allowed the snakes to bite quickly, to withdraw without harming themselves, and then to wait for the prey to die. So a very effective way of um, killing. 
Now today, evidence overwhelmingly shows that anthropoid primates react very strongly when they see snakes. Okay, these are captive born and raised rhesus macaques at the primate center near where I live in Davis, California, born and raised there. And none of them, as far as we know, has ever been harmed by a snake. Here they are reacting to a harmless gopher snake. So you can see um, the, the intensity of their interest in the snake. Okay, so let's, let's stick with venomous snakes now because here is where we see the uh, variation among the primates. So there's a consistency between the length of evolutionary time that primates have spent with venomous snakes and the degree of complexity in their visual systems. Malagasy primates have never lived with venomous snakes. There are no venomous snakes on Madagascar today, even today. And they have the simplest visual systems of all the primates. For instance, many uh, prosimians don't have uh, a fovea, so their visual acuity isn't very sharp. And they've made no trade-off between vision and olfaction, something that the monkeys and apes have done. Their, their olfactory system is, in fact, so much like those of other mammals that Back in the 70s, they were argued to be removed, taken out of the primate order because of that. And the limited behavioral evidence that we have also suggests that they don't uniformly react fearfully towards snakes. Some may even walk on snakes or snake models as if they don't even see them. They need movement in order to see them, it appears. Now, on the other extreme, we've got the old world monkeys and apes, the catarines. Um, because of where they evolved and where venomous snakes evolved, they have had continuous coexistence with venomous snakes from their beginnings. And catarines have the most complex visual systems of all the primates, including excellent visual acuity. And I won't go into the details of, of the visual system in the brain, um, just to say that there are the, the lateral geniculate nucleus, the LGN, has a layers uh, and they're most complex in the catarines. Here's, an, uh, here's a, an example that may or may not have to do with venomous snakes, but it shows the variation that we see in primates in terms of their vision. Catarines are fully trichromatic in their color vision, okay? All of the species that have been studied uh, have um, the ability to distinguish reds from greens. Now, platyrines are intermediate between the prosimians in Madagascar and the catarines um, in their visual systems. So they started out, before they diversified into platyrines, they were gener generic anthropoids along with the animals that were to become catarines. In, they started out there in the old world, in Asia or, or Africa. And so they were exposed to venomous snakes for some time in their, in their evolutionary history. But about 40 million years ago, the ancestors of platyrines moved from Africa to South America, probably um, uh, over in, with, on a land mass over water. Um, and when they got to South America, they came to a, a, a land mass that had no venomous snakes on it. So they were able to um, radiate into the different genera that we see today in the absence of venomous snakes. They started out their radiations that way. About 20 million years ago or so, snakes, venomous snakes uh, finally arrived in South America, maybe some of them as late as 3 million years ago when the, with the formation of the Panamanian land bridge. And so when the venomous snakes got there, the platyrines had already started to radiate into their different genera. And today, what we see is a lot more variation in the visual systems of platyrines than we see in catarines. Now, nobody's ever pointed this out before. The neuroscientists haven't pointed it out. They're not particularly um, interested in evolutionary questions. Uh, so, but the question is, why do we have that kind of variation? Here's one example. Besides the, there, there are differences in the LGN of the, of the various platyrines. The capuchins are much more convergent with catarines than all the other platyrines involved in terms of the complexity of the LGN. But here's something that everybody knows about probably by now, and that is that there's a lot of variation in the platyrines in color vision, okay? That most, most genera um, are, are red-green colorblind, okay? They're dichromatic, at least all the males are, um, and some females are, but some females can see, um, can distinguish reds from greens. And the exception there is, of course, the howler monkeys, 
in all of them, males and females, can distinguish reds from greens. Now, is is this is this consistency just a coincidence, or is is there a causal relationship here? So when I first proposed the snake detection theory, there wasn't any kind of direct evidence. Of course there isn't. We're talking about something that happened millions of years ago. Now, like all of the other theories about primate origins, I had to turn to comparative evidence. And one good bit of comparative evidence is, is raptors. So raptors have very good vision. They've got better vision than other, other birds, in fact. And they have eyes that are large compared to other birds. Now, all else being equal, large eyes mean better visual acuity in both birds and mammals. But raptors that specialize in eating snakes have larger eyes than raptors that don't specialize in eating snakes. They also have large heads, which presumably are required to house those large eyes. And here is how the South American laughing falcon, a snake eating specialist, is described in a field guide to the birds of South America. Now everybody knows my audience knows field guides are designed to pick out the distinctive diagnostic characteristics of the species that you're looking at. They mentioned the large eyes. So it's obviously something that is, is noticeable in these South American laughing falcons. Switching over to Africa, the same thing applies. We have snake eating specialists in Africa. Obviously, you know, well, they're called snake, African snake eagles. And the, seven, the several species of African snake eagles are described just as the laughing falcon was, with owl-like heads and large eyes. This is not the case for African eagles that don't specialize on snakes, like the African fish eagle. So imagine a snake-eating specialist raptor making a mistake and aiming for the tail instead of the head of a venomous snake. Strong selection pressure to make sure you get it right. Okay. Now. We've got the African fish eagles and the African snake eagles. They're more closely related to each other than the African snake eagles are to the South American laughing falcon. But we have a convergence in the visual systems of the snake eating specialists on both continents. Now it's possible that greater visual acuity in primates and snake eating birds may also be an example of convergent evolution. And that adaptation is perhaps to detect snakes quickly and get the head right and the tail right. Now, looking into the brain where vision mostly occurs, it had been discovered that some pulvinar neurons, remember that's the subcortical um, nucleus that's involved in non-conscious vision. It, ha it had been discovered that some of these pulvinar neurons are highly sensitive to what the researchers called moving plaid patterns. So, um, presumably, selection has favored visual sensitivity to so-called moving plaid patterns because there's something in nature that resembles the neuroscientist's uh, stimuli. Well, I ask what else in nature could represent a moving plaid pattern better than a snake does? Okay. So I write in much more detail than I can provide here in this talk. Um, two publications, if you want to delve into this further, uh, I wrote a, a book about it that prevent, provides this indirect evidence that snakes were important in primate evolution. Fortunately, um, the snake detection theory caught the eye of neuroscientists, and they became interested in testing the theory more directly, um, which has led me to some interesting and productive collaborations. So here's one of those collaborations. So um, we found that there are, in fact, uh, neurons in the pulvinar that are more sensitive to snake images than to other images, even faces of monkeys, which are clearly important to them. So these are the images that we showed the, um, the, the primates, the Japanese macaques. And here are the responses of those, those neurons to the snakes and to the other images. So the neurons responded more strongly to snakes than to those other images. These are called snake sensitive neurons. Okay, the response magnitude was much higher um, than these other images. So they responded more strongly and they responded more quickly to snakes. They responded 
um, by 55 milliseconds. So the latency to respond, 55 milliseconds, and all the others were slower. Okay, so that's one study. In another study, we found that the monkeys responded more strongly, but not more quickly, to striking snakes than to non-striking snakes. So the posture of the snake is a, a very good cue for identifying threat non-consciously. Okay. Um, it's also good to identify the threat consciously. Uh, other people will argue that the unique legless shape of snakes is a good cue to identify this, that a snake is nearby, or maybe their curvilinear shape, um, so striking snakes, um, striking posture, um, legless shape. These have been looked into. Um, and here is one example of this. Sandra Logenslag and Jan van Stryen examined the question of leglessness with early posterior negativities, or EPNs, in the occipital and parietal areas of the brain by putting electrodes on the scalps of their human subjects. Now the EPN is the difference in strength between electrophysiological responses to experimental and control stimuli. In this case, the snakes are the experimental stimuli and the, the lizards are the control stimuli. And this slide shows the strength of the relative EPN for snakes versus lizards uh, between 150 to 300 milliseconds, okay, after people were shown pictures of snakes and lizards. So snakes produced a stronger response shown here in the darker blue coloration. Now between 150 and 200, 225 milliseconds, the EPNs were most, most pronounced at the occipital electrodes and then spread to the parieto-occipital electrodes between 225 and 300 milliseconds. In other words, the visual response was stronger for snakes than for lizards and occurred in the primary and secondary visual areas, those very early parts of the conscious visual system. So recall that the pulvidar response was about 55 milliseconds, three times faster than the V1 response. Okay. My own suspicion was that although primates should use all the cues they can, the one most reliable cue for them might be the scale pattern on snake skins. And this is often, this is because often snakes are covered up by leaf litter and they may be coiled in different shapes. And, you know, maybe, maybe just a little bit of their skin is all that's visible. And you really need to, you know, that might be useful to know. Okay. So, I set out to test this idea by showing wild vervet monkeys in Kenya just a little little bit of a, a gopher snake skin, harmless snake skin, to see if they, first of all, would they detect that small amount? And if they did, what are they queuing in on? They're only, they can only be queuing in on the, the scales of that, of that snake skin. So I showed them two, 2.5 centimeters, one inch, of harmless snake skin. And you can see in this image um, that this is what the snake, in, the snake looks like, uh, taxidermy snake looks like on a table. And here's what it looks like uh, on, on a normal substrate in the, in the wild. And fortunately, vervets are obvious in their responses to snakes. They peer at them intently or they stand bipedally when they've seen them. I want to show you a clip of um, of, of how um, of how they detected the and identified the snake. Okay, so we've got I've got I've spread dried maize around these towels. There's an, about two and a half centimeters of snake skin between the two towels. A male is eating the maize. Other animals come around, and really, they're they're most wary of each other. They're paying most attention to to the social scene than anything else. They're drawn to the maize. Okay. And um, they haven't, you'll, you'll probably be able to tell when the vervets have detected this snake. So um, they're busy eating the maize. They haven't seen the snake yet. And pay attention to this one who's just come in into view. Keep your eye on that one. So they do stand bipedally to, to scan the area. That, uh, they do that regularly. So that's what that one was doing. Wasn't, they hadn't detected the snake. So again, they're paying more attention to each other and the food than anything else. 
Also pay attention to the, to the atmosphere, the ambiance. So keep your eye on that, that same vertex. Okay. It has, it has seen the snake skin. And I was actually very surprised that it saw just that little bit. Now the others are paying attention to what it's looking at. They don't know what it's looking at. But it's definitely gotten the interest of that, of that individual. And now another individual comes along, and she's even better at it. Oh, there she goes. She gives a little alarm call. And now that's alerted everybody else, and they wonder what she's looking at. And notice how very cautious she is. Um, she's still interested in the food, but she's very cautious. She keeps her eye on it, gives an alarm call. And others start peering around. Now, I have to say that vervets, I think, are really good naturalists in this case. They know that as long as they keep their eyes on it, they're okay. They're not the, the snake isn't going to hurt them. Now, let me move over to the next day, if I can. Okay, here's the next day. Um, get it going. And notice the difference. Now, there is no snake skin now there. Okay. So this is the next day. And what you see is a very different kind of atmosphere. First of all, there aren't very many vervets around. And the one that is around is much more careful about where he walks. And he's scanning where he walks. Saying as if, in his mind, I know there was a snake here yesterday. I know they don't move very far. Where is it? I've got to keep my eyes open for it. Okay, I think, I think you probably get the gist of that. Okay. Okay. So, so the snake scales grab the attention of those vervets. So we're talking now about the, the conscious visual system here. They identified it as a, as a snake just by the scales. Well, I want to say that snake scales are very attention grabbing for humans too. Now, uh, I collaborated with Jan van Stryen uh, to look at the effect of snake scales on early visual awareness. Um, and we used, again, like his other experiment, uh, lizards, lizards, and we added bird feathers. So we, we did lizard skins and bird feathers and compared them with uh, snake skins. And um, we compared them both when the, the bodies were partially exposed and when little snippets of skin or, or feathers were visible, as you can see here in this slide. Again, this is tapping into the conscious visual system. Now, the subjects were shown 300 pictures of snake skins, 300 pictures of lizard skins, and 300 pictures of birds' feathers at a rate of three images per second. And this procedure is called a Random Rapid Serial Visual Presentation, or RSVP for short. Now, this slide shows the strength of the relative EPN as I described before, for snakes versus lizards between 150 and 300 milliseconds after people were shown these pictures. Now, snakes produce a stronger response, shown in here in the darker blue coloration, in the occipital area, okay, meaning that people show the greatest early visual attention to snake skin compared to lizards and bird feathers, which means their snake, their scale pattern. Okay, the, um, yeah. Okay, so I wanna leave it at that and summarize now just by showing you a list of, of papers that I, I've become aware of over the past 14 years now since the snake detection theory was proposed. And these are all of the studies that I know of that are consistent with the snake detection theory and its predictions and it keeps growing. Although reviews of the book that I wrote um, did present challenges to the, to the idea, I've not actually run into any tests that have failed to support its predictions.
Okay. So consistent support. But I have to say that there's a lot more to do. There are a lot more predictions that need to be tested, which I present in the book. But one thing I'd like to see is more precise estimates of when venomous snakes and anthropoid primates appeared. Is there a causal relationship? Does, is the timing right? Okay. Another thing that I'd like to see is to get more field primatologists to conduct experiments like I did with the vervets. Can all anthropoid primates detect a snake skin with only two and a half centimeters showing? I would predict that catarines can do that. And I would predict that capuchins could do that because their visual systems are really convergent with catarines. But I would predict that other platyrines would need more, more than two and a half centimeters um, based on the differences in their visual systems, the complexity of their visual systems. Okay, finally, I want to also mention my collaboration, my current collaboration with herpetologist Harry Green to collect anecdotes on primate snake interactions. So, so far, we're up to actually over 200 interactions involving 32 species of snakes and 50 species of primates. And I mention this to you because particularly for those who work in India, it's a great place to see snake primate interactions. So I'd like to close this talk by sending out a request for anyone who has any anecdotes to send them our way. Our email addresses are on this slide. It's hard to publish one account but those anecdotes shouldn't go to waste. And this database will be made public so that anyone can have access to it. Okay, so that's my, this is my last slide and I wanna say thank you for uh, letting me talk to you today. Thank you, Professor Isabel. It was amazing, amazing. Many of us have been thinking and talking about for a long, long time about how predation actually makes uh, a difference in the life of these primates, in social primates. So I uh, just wanted to ask how much time we've got because we have quite some quite some questions. So for you, uh, if you're okay. I've got, as right much, yeah, I've got as much time as you want. Should I, should I move the screen to where I can actually see you? <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Uh, see if I can do that. Um, oh, let's see. Ah, here we go. Um, thank you. Okay. So, uh, shall I shall I ask the questions now? Yeah. All right. So the first question comes from Ram. So it's also on your screen, but I will uh, dictate it other anyway. So, how do you know for sure that approaching baboons are not detected by the leopard? And could it be that they detect it in the daytime? Uh, they feel that they could evade an attack or even attack the leopard. Yeah, so um, we don't know for absolutely sure because we only we are only seeing their movements. We can't see their behavior, and um, so uh, so based on their movements, we do see cases where they do move away. They do they, they're clearly detecting it because they're moving away. Okay. Um, they're they're going around it, or they're they're turning back 180 degrees. They're they're definitely moving away. Um, and when they go forward, we would expect if they had detected the leopard, their the the rate of travel would have changed. Would have um, gone. They would have gone faster, or they would have they would have gone after the leopard, and the and the leopard would have moved away. And we're not seeing that. The leopard is staying put. And the and the baboons are just walking past it, and that that looks based on their on their movements. It looks as if they're not detecting. Wonderful. Uh, the, so the second question comes from uh, Tanzim Aziza. Um, they ask, other than predatory animals, what could all be the stress factors that animals are affected by? Uh, are there any internal factors that could infect, uh, affect the health of an animal? Slightly uh -huh. topic, but yeah. Oh, oh boy. Uh, let's see. Factors that affect animals, internal factors that could affect animal cells. Well, uh, internal factors, um, disease. Uh, I don't know if that's an internal, it does affect the internal, it, it does affect the body, but it, disease is usually coming from the outside. Par parasites, 
Um, I suppose social stress uh, might might affect animals' health if um, low-ranking females perhaps might be um, might have higher cortisol levels and that might affect their their health. That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's I guess that's my best answer. Is the all screen right. is the screen all right for you guys? Are you are you are, have I got the screen right on I my I don't I know. What you're right. I don't okay. I don't know. Uh, what you're we, okay, I think it's fine. Okay. So the next question is again from Ram. So he asked if uh, alarm calls in vervet serve serve as a leopard deterrent. Then, from an evolutionary perspective, what might be stopping them from calls more often than leopards aren't really around? Um, well, I would think that if they use them when they don't need to, uh, you might have this situation where, uh, you, where you have the, the, you know, the story of the boy who cried wolf, um, that, that the conspecifics will stop reacting to them. And, and I mentioned that sometimes Adult male vervets will give alarm leopard alarm calls when they see strange adult male vervets, um, and what we what we've seen in in cases uh, experimental situations where playbacks uh, vervet alarm calls were given um, to to vervets. This wasn't at my study site. This was Robert and Seifarth and Dorothy Cheney's work. Um, they played these alarm calls over and over again, hid the the, the speaker in a bush, and after eight eight times. A male leopard finally just got so frustrated with this invisible vervet around that he left the tree and ran into the bush. He, he obviously figured there isn't a leopard. That's got to be a, a vervet just faking it. And I'm going to chase him out of there, chase him away. So, so they, they have different interpretations, I suppose, given the context of the alarm calls. So you, you don't want to, you don't want to push it if you, if you can, I suppose. And that's a fun uh, story and also a fun observation, I would say. Uh, the next question is again from Tanzim Aziza. They asked whether we can measure stress patterns with the help of using uh, sound patterns or vocal sounds made by the animal. Huh. Ah, boy. I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't know if anybody's looked at that. I wonder if animals under stress have a have a different sound to their to their voices, like you know, like humans do. Um, maybe there's some some area of study in that. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a fascinating question. I would say uh, the <laughs> next question comes from Matt Wisdom. He asks um, whether there is any there is, there is any evidence of uh, snakes preying on these stem primates, on those stem primates. Yeah, again, we're talking millions and millions of years ago. What we do know is that they had the ability to to prey on the the first uh, the crown group mammals, um, including primates. Constrictors have wide gapes. They can eat um, they can eat a huge uh, they can eat um, 100% of their body size, okay? So they can do that. They haven't changed in that respect from when they first appeared. They're do, still doing what they did, you know, maybe 100, 000, 100 million years ago. So we we have to just assume that they were eating animals, mammals um, at that stage, and some of those would have been the precursors to primates. Right. The next question is uh, also some, somewhat similar from Kunal. He says uh, whether there are any venomous snake fossils that we know from Madagascar. No, um, there today, as I said, there there are even today no venomous snakes in Madagascar, um, and Madagascar is a hard place to find fossils in any way. Um, so it's a very very poorly uh, described area uh, for fossils. Um, so. So I, I would expect, I would predict that we would never find venomous snake fossils. Um, again, that's, you know, the absence of fossils doesn't necessarily mean that there weren't animals there. Um, so, you know, one, one fossil could change the whole story. <laughs> Who knows? 
um the next question is from avdut so he asks uh, humans have always been fascinated by snakes or and bit, and have been fed with information about snakes through media such as tv or whatever however human babies do not really show fascination towards snakes and to continue with that can, can it be a fascination developed later due to being exposed to snakes and lore about snakes yeah so, so there have been studies of infants um and snakes uh, by psychologists and yes they don't they don't seem to show fear of snakes we're talking maybe 10 month old infants who don't know the stories that that we hear later on in life um they they don't show fear but they do show attention snakes draw their attention so I, what i want to do is i want to make sure that we separate out fear from attention we're drawn to snakes not everybody is afraid of snakes but we are drawn visually to snakes they can be perceived as very beautiful to us but it's hard uh, to take our eyes off of them when we see them that is true <laughs> uh, i have something on the similar lines do we know uh, when in any any of these uh, primate species would have been looked upon uh, do we have a uh, evidence that okay this attention or fear starts at a particular age uh, of an individual like any difference in the age sex uh, uh, when detecting a snake or attention towards it um are you talking about vervets or uh, people or no vervets any uh, non human primates for her no. well um that needs to be looked at more carefully in the experiment that i did I have to say that adult males never saw the snake first. <laughs> it's like it's sort of I I mean I have to joke about this. I if you've ever been in this situation where um you know okay so no I I won't say it it'll sound too too sexist. I won't say it, but it's women studies of studies have pointed to the ability of women to pay more attention to details than men. Um say you have a crowded uh you have a table with objects on it and then 15 minutes later you're you're asked what was on that table women are better able to recall the items on the table than men were and it, it maybe there's and that's been associated with sort of this hunter gatherer forager kind of um uh dichotomy that they that people have have suggested in early humans that men were the hunters and women were the gatherers and they needed to see the fruits in the in the bushes you know uh, that are hard to see but it actually may go way back before that if vervets have this distinction then it you know maybe other primates too it needs to be looked at more uh, more um uh carefully though Uh, also age uh, whether age is a factor But age um yeah it so so robert seifarth and dorothy cheney uh looked at age in um uh, uh responses to snakes giving alarm calls and that sort of thing and what they found was that infants were not as reliable as juveniles and adults that they would give alarm calls to to items that were not actually predators um uh and so i think there's there's some fine tuning that goes on as the animals age depending you know and it's probably based on their experiences and what they see in the reactions of those around them that they're picking up on the cues of you know the peering at, intently at something or standing bipedally and looking around they're picking up on those cues and learning right advantage of hosting this talk and ask another question um like uh It, could it be the uh, length of like parental investment into an individual i mean if there is more in, uh, parental investment into an in, uh, in, a, in a species whether these individuals develop this fear or attention later on in their uh, life rather than the ones which are uh, having less parental investment um you know i didn't catch the first part of your question oh i'm sorry so uh, whether parental investment has a uh, as has a uh influence on whether they at what age uh would an individual start reacting to snakes parental investment yeah um jeez yeah i um i don't know if anybody is has 
has looked at that. Again, I mean, these are great questions for future study. Um, are you going to do that? <laughs> Of course, I mean, I'm interested. I, there are a lot of different things we have to <laughs> talk about, I think. Uh, why not, I would say. <laughs> another another question. Uh, uh, one quirky uh, quote from Ram before that. He says, Vervets are so much better behaved uh, rather than humans when they see a snake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a nice um, coexistence going on. We, we're not very nice to snakes. And we... You know, we, we kill the ones that, that are good for us even, you know, the ones that um, will eat the rodents that we don't want around our, our food, for instance. And yeah, uh-oh, I lost it. Are you there? Did, did you lose yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, Okay. No, 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 we could hear you. Okay, I think, I think my screen, I think I need to do something with my screen, but I don't want to mess with it because I might, I might end up messing things up and going away. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's true. Vervets are vervets are, are better with snakes than we are. Uh, there's another question. I think this is the last question we have. Um, why why did choose uh, why did you uh, so what I believe from this question is why did you choose vervets for uh, to test the snake snake detection theory? I mean, uh, was there was there anything specific about them? Uh, they were convenient. They were they were my study animals anyway. And uh, at the time, I was trying to trap them to take some of the collars off of the females. And while I was waiting for them to get habituated again to the traps, I thought, whoa, why, not, why don't I do this little experiment? <laughs> so they were convenient. Um, it could be done on, on any primate. They're easy to do because they spend a lot of time on the ground. It's a lot harder to, to do something like that with a species that's arboreal, obviously. So. You have to somehow draw them, draw them to the snake, and you know the maze was easy. It was it was just it was convenience. So uh, another part of that question is uh, whether primates uh, can differentiate between venomous and non-venomous snake. Do you think? Yeah, I there are some stories out there. Um, I don't I don't think they've been published, though. There are some suggestions that that. Uh, that they can. Oh, actually, there there has been a, a study published on um, capuchins, and they seem to distinguish between venomous and non-venomous snakes. This is a a, a study. Um, don't know who all the authors are. Uh, Pilatico and other people. I'm sorry, I don't know the reference. But um, and those are capuchins, and I'm not surprised about capuchins. I'm not sure that other platyrines would be able to do that. That is interesting to look at. Um, another, so are you okay with a, a few more questions? Yeah. All right. So the next question is from Jayadi. He asked uh, whether a dummy snake can dummy snake can be used near crop field to stop macaques from crop damage. In his area, Burmese python is one of the natural predators for uh, rhesus macaques. Yeah, I think it might work very temporarily. Um, they don't, as you saw in the, with this with the vervets, they don't leave the area when they see a snake. They they don't run away like they would a leopard, um, and they kept eating. So I have a feeling that all it would do is it would is um, make them pay a little bit more attention to where that snake image or the the snake model is, or the partial model partial snake skin, and then they go on feeding in the crops. So, yeah, I don't think it would work. <laughs> uh, Smitha asks um, whether Slender Lotus, so she is actually uh, sharing an, uh, an anecdote that Slender Lotuses in her field site were not bothered by a viper, which was one or two meters away from them. Oh, that's so. interesting. Uh, so, so are you sure they saw the viper to begin with they probably saw it otherwise but could we confirm um, smitha can you uh, if you can hear us please type in. Um, meanwhile we can uh, jump to the other, to the other question and like, so uh, there are observation about reaction of uh, lion cobras so it would be interesting to see whether these See these observation in light of you know, snake detection theory. 
So it was more of a code than a question. Yeah, uh, yeah, it would be great. It'd be great to, you know, yeah. If you if you have those observations, write them up and try to publish them. If you can't get them published, send them to Harry and me, and we'll put them in the Snake Primate database. Awesome. So I think we uh, are done with all the questions. So a lot of okay. So Smita is responding that no, the Loris uh, female was not really bothered by it. Okay. Okay. Now that's and so she saw the she saw the uh, viper. Okay. The so person. so that that is not surprising to me. Um, they are so they are prosimians. They're strepsorines, and strepsorines don't have very good vision. I focused on the Malagasy strepsorines because. For sure, venomous snakes don't occur there. Uh, one thing that I that I mentioned in the book was the the situation between uh, with the the African and Asian strepsorines. Okay, so they're they're nocturnal also, and so they that's a that's a situation that the diurnal primates don't have to deal with. So you've got you've got sunlight acting against you. You need sunlight to have good vision, but what the the um, the nocturnal what the strepsorines in Africa and Asia seem to have done instead of expanding their visual sense um, beyond what they could do with constrictors their ancestors did with constrictors is they 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 had to take a different route because of their nocturnality and what you see in some of the nocturnal strepsorines in Africa and Asia are really weird defense mechanisms um, that you, you don't see in other species for instance the the um the the um the, the scapular shield on potos where they they tuck their heads down and this the bony bony protuberance sticks out now snakes eat their their prey head first uh this, the prey is going in head first and that scapular shield might help them keep their heads from going completely into the mouth of the of the snake and potos also have uh, what is called a death drop. So in the presence of a snake or a snake model, they will they will plummet up to 100 meters, maybe it's feet, <laughs> I can't remember, down to the ground um, uh, when, 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 uh, when in the presence of these models or these real snakes. So these are something, something, some things that you don't see. And then you have to wonder about the, um, the, the toxins that some of the some of the strepsorines produce uh, and spread around their bodies. Okay, um, maybe that's a snake repellent. It needs to be looked at. So, but none of the Malagasy lemurs have these. So, now you have to ask yourself why. <laughs> Um, I actually, uh, even the questions would suggest that really we, the more questions were from the snake point of view, so we can actually say that, okay, we are really fascinated about snakes. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Isabel, so much. And it was a real honor and a pleasure to have you here and listen to such an amazing talk. And like so many of us are thinking on our own, spe on our uh, spe study species, and we are thinking, oh, how we can answer some of these questions. Yeah, so yeah. I, you know, <laughs> so, uh, like, you have let, asked us to brainstorm and it was really amazing and we would really like to thank you for, uh, i would really like to thank you from um, on behalf of aip to really you know um, accept our invitation and to come here we are relatively very we are a very new for, um, organization and we are run by mostly by early career scientists and this talk would really help us a lot not only as an uh, as the organization but also as individuals and I would really like to thank you. Uh, and if you would like to have some few words. Well, I want to just again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet me. Oh, well, I've met you already, Partha, but meet other people in, in the organization and, and to yeah, give me a chance to talk about my research because it really, you know, the next step is um, more people testing these ideas. I can't Obviously, I can't go all around the world and test it, uh, test these ideas against other species. We need more people looking at this question, um, all of these questions, predator prey interactions. It's a hard thing to do. Snakes, snake primate interactions are not that hard, but the other ones, the leopards, you know, yeah. tigers, whatever, they're harder. Um, but but they're worth pursuing, and only then can we get um, good answers to our 
to what is, you know, so there's still assumptions in our field. And I'm not satisfied with assumptions. So go out and do the work. <laughs> I think that's a good thing when you are not. Thank you so much, Dr. Isabel. I would like to thank you again for, thank the, you. for the amazing immersive talk. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank you, Partha.